Good morning, Prairie Heights. That was pretty good. Let's try it again. Good morning, Prairie Heights. Yeah, yeah that coffee's uh, working now. Good. Hey, my name is Byron, and I always love coming here. It's good to be back with you. Um, <clears throat> I've heard it said that sometimes, and I, I know this may sound sexist, but sometimes a woman will stand in front of a closet and go, I have nothing to wear. Now, the giggles tell me that there's some accuracy to that. Now, I sort of experienced that. Uh, you know, I drove up from Minneapolis last night, stayed in a hotel, and this morning, you, you know, the closet's in a hotel room. They're basically a wooden box, not very big, right? And so I, I, I looked in there, and I went, man, I got nothing to wear except two choices. What should I wear when I speak at Prairie Heights? So this was choice number one, you know, nice vest, especially when it's 10 degrees out yet, and I think spring is actually supposed to be here on the calendar at least. Uh, this was one choice, and this was the other choice. <laughs> is this a sweet coat or what? By the way, you can't feel it from where you are, but it's corduroy too. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, what do you think? Do you, should I try to model it for you? you? You think that'd be good? Okay, okay. Yeah, because I am a, th this is such a great part of my life experience. Uh, you see, I bought this coat 48 years ago. <laughs> You're going, you must not have worn it that often. Uh, and the amazing thing is that even after 48 years, it still fits just perfectly. Yeah, right, 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 right. And so uh, you got to know something. This was in the 70s, all right? So <clears throat> let, me, uh, let me just tell you, I decided to make a bold fashion statement because I was having trouble getting dates. And I thought if I could get something really snappy, maybe girls would go out with me. So uh, not only did I have this, but I had a, a, a dark green polyester shirt uh, unbuttoned to about right here, and then a big gold chain, <laughs> big white belt, cream-colored bell bottoms, saddleback platform shoes, and of course, full beard and afro out to here. I had to start writing girls' names down. I mean, it worked so well. <laughs> My wife and I just celebrated our 45th wedding anniversary, and she, she asked me, she, oh, I was going to say she asked me to wear it, but no, that's not true, so I don't want to lie to you. But I think it's one of the things that drew her to me many, many years ago, right? So I thought it would be appropriate, though, to pull this out of the closet and wear this today because we're in part three of our series on resilience, and we're looking at some, uh, some Bible characters to learn more about what it means to be resilient and how you do that and, you know, how to bounce back, how to recover when, the, you know, when the going gets tough, do the tough get going and, and all of that about being resilient. And so today we're going to look at the person of Joseph. And Joseph is probably well known for having a coat of many colors. Now, if you've never, if you've not been a church-going person too much, you may not have heard about this. You might have heard about a show called uh, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dream Coat or something like that. But this is the Bible story, the real story. And uh, he had a coat of many colors, and so I just thought I'd wear my coat of many colors. But then it got better because just last week, it came out in the news that over in the Middle East, some biblical Old Testament archaeologists were digging, and they found a picture of Joseph wearing the original coat of many colors. And I believe we have that picture with us right now, if you'll just take a look at that. <laughs> I mean, Joseph, Byron, we both know how to wear coats, right? Right. So I do that because I want you to remember the story. Uh, it's just that this, with the quarter eye thing, uh, I can't worry. This is going to be too hot. By, by the way, uh, I was so into fashion that I don't care if it's quarter I wore it during July, too. So, all right. So we're going to take a look at Joseph. 
And not only is he known for his coat of many colors, but he's known for his faith. In fact, he's in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 2 and 22. Look what we find. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It's the evidence of things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. And believe me, Joseph, quite the reputation. It was by faith that Joseph, when he was about to die, said confidently that the people of Israel would leave Egypt. Joseph, we're going to find out, was resilient because he was faithful. He learned what it, mean, what it meant to be faithful to the faithful God. Let me give you a definition of being faithful. Faithful means trusting in God and doing what he says regardless of the circumstances or even the consequences. Let me tell you about somebody who right now I see demonstrating faithfulness. It's my cousin Bert. Uh, He's had a tough go of it the last two or three weeks. Two weeks ago... The same week that his father died, uh, Bert was diagnosed with cancer. And so he's got several upcoming surgeries. It looks hopeful, but yet it's a challenge. And for those of you who have had cancer and you survived or you have cancer in your family or friends and you know loved ones and friends who haven't survived, it's a tough deal. The big C is scary. And it's understandable why it can throw us into... A lot of doubts and a lot of fear. So last night when I talked to him, I said, how are you really doing? And he said, Byron, I'm good. I'm good. God has been faithful to me all my life. He's in his early 60s. He's been faithful to me all my life, and so I trust him. I trust him, and that gives me peace and comfort and courage. How about you this morning? Are you and I able to trust God no matter what. That's part of being faithful. And it can be easy to fall into despair when life gets so tough, when life knocks us down, and and we, we might even start questioning God, like, God, really? Why? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to my family? Will we be resilient? Will we find hope? Will we be faithful? Because if there's anyone who had reason not to be resilient, not to be faithful, it might have been Joseph in the Old Testament. Because we're going to find out, I mean, Joseph was was sold into slavery because his brothers betrayed him and he was falsely accused of sexual assault by Potiphar's wife, and he was unjustly thrown into prison, and he was separated from his loving dad for many, many years, and he faced the pressure of literally saving thousands and thousands and thousands of lives during a famine. I mean, if anyone had reason perhaps not to be resilient or not to live a faithful life to God, it might have been Joseph. But that's not the case. In fact, even Pharaoh himself, the ruler of Egypt, who worshipped pagan gods, listen and look at how he described Joseph. In Genesis chapter 41, verse 38, Pharaoh asked his officials, can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the Spirit of God? And of course, we can't be faithful on our own. It's the faithful God using his spirit in us to be faithful, and then we can be resilient. Now, for those of you who are not yet Christ followers, it's okay. And if you haven't heard this story before, I I think you're going to really enjoy it. It takes up 13 chapters in the book of Genesis. And so I'm going to tell you some of the story. I'm going to read some of the story to you. But the bottom line is this. It's all about faithfulness if we're going to be resilient. So the question is, how can you and I grow in faithfulness to God? To answer that question, we're going to take a look at several lessons from the life of Joseph. Here's the first lesson. Trust God to help you live in humility. 
Trust God to help you live in humility. Sounds easy, maybe. Mm. Sometimes it's hard to be humble. Have you ever noticed that you can sort of spot arrogance pretty quickly or you can spot humility fairly quickly? Let me give you an example. This just happened to Linda and I just two weeks ago when we went to Florida on vacation to celebrate our anniversary. We're, we're taking a flight from Minneapolis down to Florida and on the flight from Minneapolis to Atlanta, uh, the lead flight attendant gets on the air and is making the announcements, you know, and some people are listening, some people are not. And, and then he, you know, can I just say, he started to sound arrogant to me. It's sort of like he was on a power trip. And especially when he got to the part about, okay, folks, and keep in mind that federal regulations determine that you must be wearing your masks at all times. Failure to comply with these regulations may result in a warning, maybe a second warning, but you should realize this. You may be removed from the plane. Thought, wow, arrogant. A good friend of mine flew to Arizona the same week. His experience was different. He had a humble lead flight attendant. This guy gets on the, on, on the speaker, and he says, Hey, folks, so glad you're flying with us. It's our pleasure to serve you. And, uh, and uh, by the way, you know there's these federal regulations as we're trying to get to the end of the pandemic, and, and I know some of you are probably tired of it, wearing these masks and everything. Uh, and, you, you know, just so you know, uh, we're going to ask you to comply. You might get a warning. You might get a second warning. Uh, hey, you could even be removed from the flight. But please know, I promise you, we will land the plane before we remove you from the flight. <laughs> I want to hang out with that guy. I don't want to hang out with the first guy. Arrogance versus humility. Uh, we pick up the story in Genesis chapter 37 about Joseph. He's 17 years old. Listen to this. This is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. He worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. But let me do a timeout. Those of you who are expecting twin girls... Just a good idea, perhaps, on what to name your twin girls, Bilhah and Zilpah. I, I, I don't know if it'll work, but you could think about it. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things that his brothers were doing. Mm-hmm, tattletale. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. Listen, I'm 69. If I have a kid now, I'm going to be in shock. Okay. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. Here's what you got to know. A coat of many colors. Uh, the typical cloak in the culture of that day was a, a, probably a short sleeve uh, down to here, kind of like a sport coat, and, uh, but very blah, beige in color, nothing, just very neutral. But... Royalty, do you know what they wore? They wore, you know, ankle length robes, incredible colors. I mean, you could spot royalty quite a ways away. And so Jacob, right or wrong, he gave Joseph, his son, this beautiful king like robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. Uh, parents don't play favorites. They could not say a kind word to him. One night, Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listen to the dream. Listen to the dream, he said to his brothers. Uh, we were out in the field, tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly, my bundle stood up and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. His brothers responded, so... You think you're going to be our king, do you? Do you actually think that you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way that he talked about them. Now, I didn't say at the beginning that Joseph is perfect. God grew him. But he is arrogant right now. He's way overconfident. But God gives him the chance to learn about humility because here's what happens next. I'll tell you this part. 
doesn't take long, and Joseph has another dream, and he proceeds to tell his brothers about it. He says, oh, by the way, guys, there's another dream. I dreamt that there was a sun, a moon, and 11 stars. And so, by the way, he has 11 brothers, just in case you're counting. 11 brothers all bow down to me. Can you imagine what they thought of him then? I mean, the, the dreams and the arrogant comments just keep piling up. So it doesn't take long, and the half-brothers, they're off taking care of livestock a few miles away, and Jacob says to Joseph, hey, go check on your brothers. I want to see how they're doing, you know, and then get back to me. And so Joseph takes off, and he heads to go check out his brothers, see how they're doing, and his brothers see him coming toward them. And when they see him, they're starting to, you know, to talk to each other and grumble about this kid, Joseph. You know, I can't stand him. I hate him. And they actually plot to kill him. But Reuben, who has a little more compassion than most of the brothers, uh, he says, we can't kill him. Imagine that, what that would do to our father, Jacob. Uh, I got a better idea. Why don't we... There's an old well here, an old cistern that's dried up. Let's throw him in there, and we'll, then, then we'll just let him die. And actually, what Reuben was thinking is that later on when the brothers left, he would actually go back to the cistern and rescue his brother. And so they said, well, so what are they going to do? Well, about that time, Ishmaelite traders come you know, by. I don't know if they're on camels or, or if they're walking. I think they're on camels. But they come by, and uh, ha, ha, some of the brothers get a better idea. Why not make a little money? So they sell their brother. They get him out of the cistern and sell him to these slave traders who go off to Egypt and end up selling Joseph as a slave to Potiphar, captain of the palace guard for Pharaoh. So what happens? <laughs> these brothers, they kill a goat and they take Joseph's coat before the traders ride off with him and they dip it in goat's blood and then bring it back to their dad, Jacob, and try to tell him the lie. And he bought it that a wild animal attacked and killed Joseph. All right. So you, you got to wonder. I mean, think about this. When Joseph is in that cistern overhearing his brothers deciding how they're going to kill him, what they're going to do, and then these slave traders come by and then he is, uh, you know, off to Egypt being sold as a slave. You got to wonder if maybe he was reconsidering the idea of a little humility in his life. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. Pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. I have a bunch of grandkids, some little ones. If you're the parents of little ones or you remember having little ones, you can all identify with this. You're outside, you've got a two-and-a-half-year-old because you love that little guy and you want him to be safe and you know the best for him. You're getting sidewalks, streets. Okay, you're going to hang on to that little kid's hand, right? But what do little toddlers do? They're born, we're all born, by the way, with a sin nature that is selfish and independent. So what, what does he do? He breaks loose from your hand because he wants to do it his way. He wants to be in charge of his own little life. And then, bam, he falls down. Pride and haughtiness precede a fall. Years ago, when I was starting out in ministry, uh, I went skiing for the very first time, took my youth group, and there was a bunch of avid skiers in my youth group, and they were trash-talking me because they found out this was going to be the first time I'd ever snow skied in my life. And so I thought, oh, it can't be that big of a deal, right? And so we're at the ski resort and everything, and, and so uh, they said, hey, Byron, you might want to take a lesson. I said, who needs a lesson? I mean, you sit on that little thing that goes up the mountain, and you get off, and you got these two things that slide down the hill. Big deal, right? I was being prideful. So I end up on a chairlift by myself, and as we're going higher and higher and higher, I'm realizing I'm getting more scared and more scared. And more. I mean, we're really up there. And Oh, good. And then I saw the little station at the top of the hill, the one where the chairlift comes, and it gently lets everybody off <laughs> so they can have a wonderful time skiing down the mountain, right? <laughs> well, I didn't know better, and I just thought, I'm good. 
So instead of lifting up the tips of my skis a little bit when I get off that chair, I pointed them down. Yeah, and I can tell the way you're laughing. You know when you point them down, what do you do? You fall face forward. I mean, I face planted in the snow, skis sticking up in the air, and I was stuck, and I couldn't get out of the way, and the chair left behind me has two skiers on it, and they come, and they can't get out of my way, and so they literally fall on top of me. Now, the third chair behind me comes up. They've got two more, probably inexperienced and prideful, just like me, and so they fall, and now we've got about five or six people in a pile. It looked like a crashing Jenga game. <laughs> and of course, didn't want to lose my cool, so I jumped up, and I went, who fell? Now, we can laugh at that, but you know what? The sad truth in this life, and we see it from God's word, is that pride, haughtiness, arrogance precedes a fall. Whether you are new to church or you've been going to church a long time, you hear about Christian leaders who have fallen morally. I know individuals who have fallen morally and every single time, do you know what I knew about that person? They were arrogant. And I think what happens is that people get to the point where they're going, hey, I'm good, I'm good. And what happens is that people, they, they tend to be independent from God. They're going, hey, I can, I've done, you know, I know this Christian thing and I can, I can get by and we tend to coast a little bit. And then one thing piles up after another and pretty soon we have a very serious fall in our life, in our relationship with God. Lesson number one on being and growing in faithfulness. Learn to live with humility. Here's the second lesson. Trust God to help you live in his presence. Trust God to help you live in his presence. And Joseph demonstrates this. And in fact, in these 13 chapters, several times, we actually find the phrase that describes Joseph as, the Lord was with Joseph. Let me show you an example. From Genesis chapter 39, starting at verse 1, when Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. The Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph. You see, Joseph is living in the presence of the Lord. He gets it. This pleased Potiphar, so he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. Think about that. He goes from a pit about to be killed by his brothers, and now he's got this major leadership role with Potiphar. From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. God had a plan. All his household affairs ran smoothly and his crops and livestock flourished. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. Living in his presence. We are living in his presence when we become a Christ follower because God takes the part that knows him the best, his own spirit, his own Holy Spirit, and that Holy Spirit comes to live and dwell in our lives when we say yes to Christ. Now, if you're not yet a Christ follower, that might be more difficult to understand. In fact, the Bible actually tells us is that when we become a Christ follower, our eyes are opened to the things of God. And so I want you to see where this comes from. In John chapter 14, verses 16 to 17, John is writing this. He's quoting Jesus. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. Jesus is talking about the fact that he's going to return to heaven. And this advocate will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world can't receive him 
because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. If we're not living each and every day in the presence of God's spirit in us as Christians, we're going to tend to coast. We're going to become more independent. We're going to try to do things our way. Maybe we won't spend time conversing with Jesus through prayer or reading his word. We, we tend to coast. But then something really bad happens in our lives and we freak out. And then we're in desperate situation and we cry out, God, where were you? Do you see what's going on? Can you believe this? Why, why, why? And it's almost like we think God is in heaven. And when we cry out, he goes, wow. You're kidding. When did that happen to you? Couldn't be farther from the truth. God is present. He sees all. He knows all. He knows our hurt. He knows our pain. He wants us to live in his presence. And so whether you're in a business meeting, you're not sure it's going to go very well, and there's angst between employees... Imagine this because you're living in his presence. Now, you're not going to actually see Jesus physically, but you may as well because through his spirit, he's present with you. At the end of the table, second row, big meeting, here's Jesus sitting there going, come on, you can do it, you can do it. You're a student, and you're taking a test, and you're struggling, you've studied, you've, you're taking this test, and what is the answer to that next question? And you look over, and here's Jesus sitting in the row next to you. He's going, come on, you studied. I'll help you remember. I'm present with you. Or it's evening time, and your farming husband is still out in the field, and things are running late, and you're inside the farmhouse by yourself, young mom, and you've got three little crabby, irritated, trouble screaming kids and you're trying to feed them and you feel alone and you're frustrated and you're fatigued <sighs> you take a deep breath and you look into the family room here's Jesus I created you I created your little ones we can do this together live in his presence the next lesson that we learn from Joseph about helping us grow in faithfulness is trust God to help you live with integrity. Trust God to help you live with integrity. Now, last month when I was here, I talked about character, and I defined character this way. Character is who we are and how we live when we don't think anyone can see us or when nobody will find out. That's character. That's Another way to describe it is that's living with integrity if we're doing it God's way. Let me read to you what happened that Joseph demonstrates his integrity. See, he had been faithful, and so he's leading up to an incredible temptation. Let's find out if he was full of integrity. In Genesis 39, Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man. Now, keep in mind... He no longer had his coat of colors, but he was still good looking. Just, just wanted you to know that. <laughs> Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything as an entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. But she kept pressuring him day after day. And so one time he's in the palace and he's working. And what does she do? She comes up and she literally just grabs him and says, sleep with me. And he does the right thing because he's full of integrity. And he runs and he flees. But she's still holding on to his coat. So what does she do? She's mad. She's been showing up. So she screams and her servants come running. And she says, this Joseph, this Hebrew slave, he tried to rape me. So then her husband, Potiphar, captain of the palace guard, he finds out. And now, of course, he's furious. Even though Joseph is being falsely accused, Potiphar throws Joseph into prison. <laughs> wow. But Joseph was full 
of integrity. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 to 16, so you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say you must be holy because I am holy. Joseph was learning to live with humility. He was living in the Lord's presence, and he was living with integrity. He was becoming more of a holy, faithful servant of the holy God. The story continues. So here's Joseph. He's in prison. And because he's just a leader, you know what happens, don't you? The Lord's with him. And so the people in charge of the prison, they put him in charge of other prisoners. It doesn't take long, and he gets two new prisoners that now he's supervising in the jail. And these two new prisoners are, number one, the cupbearer for Pharaoh, and number two, the chief baker for Pharaoh. And somehow they offended him, and so Pharaoh throws them both in jail. And they're in jail together for a while until one night, the chief baker and the cupbearer, they both have a dream. And the next morning, they're really confused about their dream. And, and so they say something to Joseph. And Joseph says, well, let me see if I can help you interpret your dreams. Because the only way he's going to do that is because God is empowering him through his spirit. He's faithful. And so the, the cupbearer says, well, I had a dream about this beautiful grapevine. And there were three branches. And each branch had luscious grapes, and I saw myself serving wonderful wine to Pharaoh again. Chief Baker said, well, I had an interesting dream too. I dreamt that I made three incredible tasty pastries, and these pastries were on my head, but all of a sudden birds came and started eating the pastries off my head. Can you help us? Joseph said, yes, but I'll be honest, I have good news and bad news. First, the good news for you, the cupbearer. In three days, Pharaoh will let you out of prison, and once again, you'll be serving him great wine. Not so good news for you, the chief baker. In three days, Pharaoh's going to let you out of prison, but he's still mad at you, so he's going to impale you on a pole and leave you there until the birds come and eat your flesh. You talk about having a bad day. Joseph was giving them the interpretation from God to what was going to happen, and it was accurate. But before these guys leave the prison, Joseph said to the cupbearer, hey, would you remember me? In fact, when you, when you talk to Pharaoh, try to put a good word in there for me. I mean, I've been in here for quite a while already, and I'd love to get out. But the cupbearer forgets until two more years go by. Now Pharaoh has a dream. And Pharaoh has this dream. He dreams that there's seven fat, healthy cows grazing in the pasture by a river. And all of a sudden, seven skinny cows come up and swallow the seven fat, healthy cows. And then he dreams about a wheat field. And in this wheat field, he sees seven grains, seven heads of healthy grain. And all of a sudden... He sees seven rotting, terrible, dried out grains come and swallow up the seven healthy grains. And he asks his magicians for interpretation. They can't help him out. And then all of a sudden the cupbearer goes, hey, wait a minute. I remember this guy, this Hebrew guy. In, uh, yeah, I think he's still in jail, in fact. Oh, that was a couple of years ago, but Pharaoh, you might want to bring him in because he, he correctly uh, interpreted our dreams. And so Pharaoh goes, okay, bring him in here because nobody else can interpret my dream. And so Joseph comes in. Pharaoh tells him his dream, and Joseph said, yeah, I can help you out. Here's the deal, Pharaoh. Uh, there's going to be seven years of incredible, bountiful crops. And then there's going to be seven years of drought and famine. So what you need to do is that you need to set aside every year of those seven years of bountiful crops and store some of that grain so that your people will have food to eat when that seven-year famine hits. And Pharaoh is so impressed. 
He puts him in charge. In fact, he makes him the number two guy in Egypt. Again, the Lord was with Joseph. So meanwhile, back at the ranch in Canaan, Jacob, Joseph's brothers, and their extended families are into the famine, and they're starving. They hear that Egypt has food. It has grain. So Jacob says, okay, guys, go to Egypt. Go to Pharaoh and see if you can buy some grain so that we can eat, so that we can live, so that we can survive. And so they take off, and they go, and they're ushered into the court where Joseph is presiding, except they don't recognize Joseph because he has an Egyptian haircut and he has a royal Egyptian robe deal on his body. And so they bow down before him. Oh, does anybody remember his dreams? Interesting, huh? Joseph recognizes them instantly, but he doesn't say anything. So because he wants to maybe have them a lesson, learn a lesson, he creates some tests for them, including going back to Canaan and, and coming back with his, his younger brother, Benjamin, who his father, Jacob, loved dearly. And, of course, there's a back and forth. And, but finally, because they're desperate, Jacob and the brothers bring Benjamin. And so they come and they bow down before him again. And now Joseph begins to weep. And he reveals his identity as their brother. And he says, I'm going to take care of you. We're going to get dad we're going to get the whole family, come live in Egypt, and I'll take care of you. So not only did that happen, but thousands and thousands of lives of Egyptians were saved because Joseph was faithful. So the last lesson, trust God to help you trust his plan. Trust God to help you trust his plan. Have you ever noticed that... Uh, we might say, hey, I trust God. He's a loving God. I trust God. He's the creator. But do we trust God when life is not going well? Do we trust his plan then? When life is something we don't like, it's awful. It's like when our oldest son, we call him BJ, when he was still Benji, when he was three years old, it's at the dinner table and we're having peas as the vegetable. And he's not eating them. He ate everything else. And I said, uh, Benji, you need to eat your peas. He says, I don't like peas. I said, we still need to eat your peas. I can't. I can't. I said, why can't you? He says, I, I just can't. I can't eat my peas, Dad. And so I said, well, I know your mouth works. You ate your potatoes. You ate your chicken. But so you can eat your peas. And you can see the little wheels turning. He said, Daddy, I can't eat the peas. I said, why not? Because I love you so much. <laughs> Do we ever find ourselves saying to God, God, this isn't fair. I shouldn't have to go through something like this in life. I should not have to experience something so distaste distasteful. Because I love you. And you know, since I love you, you should really let everything go well for me. But that's not the way it is. We live in a broken, fragile, sinful world. And so here's what happens. Back in Egypt, Jacob dies. And so what Joseph and the extended family do is that they go back to Canaan for the funeral. And then when they come back to Egypt again, now the brothers are getting nervous because now dad, Jacob, is out of the picture. So let's pick it up because they're going, uh-oh, now we're in trouble. Joseph's going to get even with us. Genesis chapter 50, verses 16 to 20. So they sent this message to Joseph. Before your father died, he instructed us to say to you, please forgive your brothers for the great wrong they did to you, for their sin in treating you so cruelly. So we, the servants of the God of your father, beg you to forgive our sin. And when Joseph received this message, he broke down and he wept. And then his brothers came and threw themselves down before Joseph. Once again, they're bowing down. Look, we're your slaves, they said. And this is one of the most powerful couple of verses in all of the Bible. But Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position 
so that I could save the lives of many. God is a redeeming God. He has a big picture plan. Someday when this life is over, someday when, if we're a Christ follower and we die, we're going to go home to heaven. God is saving that eternal home for us. In the meantime, he wants us to trust him, even when life is hard, because you know what he can do? Just like in this story, he can turn something that was so bad into something that's so good, because that's who God is. Let me finish with this. Years ago, when I was pastoring a different church, there were two kids in our youth group, and Christy was a junior and Jeff was a senior. And uh, they were high school sweethearts, and Jeff is graduating. It's getting close to graduation time. In fact, it's just a, a week away. And uh, I'll never forget, I'm getting ready to go uh, speak in the service, and I run into Jeff in the, in the men's room. So we're talking about graduation and his reception coming up. And, and uh, so I said, so Jeff, what's after graduation for you? He goes, well, Byron, you know, I'm just so excited. You know, I've got some options. I'm going to go to school. But the most important thing is I want my life to count for Jesus. I want to honor him with my life. I have so many friends and family members who don't know Jesus. I want to help them come to know Jesus. Several days later, in a community celebration, Jeff and Christy were in a car, and they left the parade, and they were going to head out to a different location, and they're crossing the train tracks, but they didn't see the train or didn't hear the whistle and all the commotion. And this train came and broadsided Jeff and Christy in their vehicle on Jeff's side. Jeff was killed instantly. Christy hung on. It was touch and go for weeks. She went into a coma. She was on life support. But in the meantime, while she's in the hospital, we're praying for God to do a miracle. I had both the difficult time and the incredible privilege of doing Jeff's funeral. Well over a thousand people in this high school auditorium. And I was able to share the good news of Jesus. I shared with him what I just shared with you. That Jeff wanted his life to count for Jesus. And here... The irony was that such a horrible tragedy happened to Jeff, but God was going to use it for something good. In fact, many students that day put their faith in Christ as their Savior. Months went by while Christy is in a coma. God woke her up, and though disabled, and it took a year or two for her to get to the point where she could function again, God spared her life and has used her life in a tremendous way. And now just several months ago, now at the age of 39, 22 years after the accident, I had the privilege of doing her wedding. And her life continues. How about you this morning? What seems so hard in your life? Do you have faith? Are you and I willing to grow in faithfulness so that we might be resilient no matter what? Don't forget, God wants us to live in humility. He wants us to live in his presence. He wants us to live with integrity, and he wants us to trust his plan. Because ultimately, it's good. He's saving it for us in heaven for eternity. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you and praise you for the truth of your word and the incredible story of Joseph. And I just ask your spirit to, first of all, nudge the heart and the mind of anyone here who has not yet put their faith in you as Savior. Maybe this is their day. Simple faith. You died and you rose again to prove that you can forgive us. And then, God, for the rest of us, I pray that this week we would seek you out to hear from you on how we might trust you more completely so that we grow in faithfulness. And I pray this all in Jesus' name, amen.